uh, so please welcome all the way from Chicago, who is missing his dog right now, Matt Geller. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. My name is Matt Geller, and uh, I've only got half an hour to show you all of this, so um, I need to cut out a whole bunch of jokes and uh, not make this too terribly funny, and I apologize for that already. And uh, I am going to do a monologue at the beginning of the presentation and then go into the actual software demo. So if you're not into sort of manifesto-like monologues, then you'll probably just want to play with your phone, go to the bathroom, do something like that. And then when you see me start playing around with the screen, you'll know that I'm doing the actual software demo. <laughs> I design large collaborative um, uh, systems for uh, editors. That's what I do in my company. And uh, some of my former clients are Madison Square Garden, New York Times, and uh, Major League Baseball Network. Some of my current clients are in-demand networks in New York City and uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Large systems where the two basic paradigms are shared storage pools so that everybody can attach themselves to that storage at the same time, and then you kind of slather on some media asset management on top so people can search, do automated ingest, archiving, push button deliverables, um, et cetera, et cetera. And these kinds of systems work very well for those large collaborative groups. Throughout the years, um, people have come up to me and said, what about us? And the us that I'm referring to are the small collaborative work groups, um, groups of two, three, four, five, six people that are doing really incredible work. And actually, it seems to me that those small collaborative work groups are the ones that I really wanted to help the most. And the fact is, is that I couldn't. And the reason why, most of the time, was that the kinds of systems I put together are too expensive. But there are other reasons, too. They require a lot of cooling and redundant power, and you need to rack them in racks. And some of these collaborative work groups would, like event videographers, they would go to an event, and they would work together, and then their deliverables are due at the end of the event, like that night or the end of the weekend or documentarians that had to go on site to gather all their footage, three or four of them, and they wanted to work together collaboratively. And the bottom line is, there are systems that are out there that like have handles on them that you can take and, and uh, you know, set them up on site. But the fact was, uh, invariably, one of those variables would, would make it unaffordable or too cumbersome for them to, um, to work together collaboratively. And so um, this year at NAB, a former student of mine came to me and showed me a piece of software that he's developing that's going to be on the App Store a little later this summer, probably in July. And I felt that it was such a compelling uh, piece of software that I wanted to show it to user groups just so that we could get some buzz generated about it. I, in fact, I even showed it to Larry Jordan and Philip Hodgetts at the show. They thought it was really cool, too. And what it really does is it actually gives you an asset management solution for just you, the individual, with an option to share that environment with others that you may be working with. And the idea was so clean and lovely and used a lot of wonderful OS X um, development libraries that are available to the developer these days that I thought it's, it's just too good not to you know, sneak peek to, to folks and get, get them excited about it. One thing that is absolutely true over the last 10 years is that the empowerment of the individual creative through technology has always, always been uh, coming forth. The, the concept of this laptop that's right here on the table and this funny little USB 3 drive that has an SSD inside of it uh, with the fact that it has much more capacity than the original array I had for my editing system you know, 15 years ago, and much, much faster. These kinds of things uh, are the cameras that are available today. Um, so cameras, laptops, little pieces of storage that are directly attached to a computer, that's all good. That's all gotten incredibly cheap. That's all, been, uh, that, that's all gotten extremely fast, extremely reliable. And so the only thing that I thought was missing was an idea of collaboration. How could people truly collaborate? And what I found is that small groups don't necessarily need to share all of their stuff with each other all the time. They need to share some of their stuff with each other. Um, and when they need to share this stuff with each other, they don't want to stop what they're doing in order to do it. Like the typical thumb drive sneaker net example where you plug something in and you stop what you're doing to do it, copy the stuff, get it to the other person, they plug in, et cetera, et cetera. So this little program is called Keepflow, 
Keyflow Pro. Um, and uh, it's a binary application uh, that you know, you'll download from the App Store. And uh, you, what, hopefully what you're going to see as I demonstrate it is uh, you'll begin to see how you're going to want to use it. And uh, if, if that's what starts generating in your mind as I do it, then I, I think I've done a, a, a good job. So um, what you're seeing is the, the main UI. And um, I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about it and then kind of back up and start uh, a new library and show you how you can actually start to work with it. So obviously, you have a browse window in the, in the middle of the screen. You have uh, information uh, panels over on the right. And then you have a sort of filtration and categorization uh, panel over on the left. And as you can see, I have uh, what's considered a catalog here. Um, of all kinds of different pieces of media, but not only media like uh, movies and sound files and um, pictures, but also you can do any, really, any kind of document. And in fact, if the Mac OS has some kind of intelligence about the file, then this program uh, will too. And it's actually going to leverage a lot of the top-level libraries um, that are available to OS X developers today in order to, to, to do that. Um, some of the wonderful features that I'll just show you right up front is that when you click on a particular item within your catalog, then over here on the right-hand side, you see a whole bunch of um, information uh, about it, including uh, the actual place where it resides, um, its create and modification dates, uh, and stuff like that. But it also has you know, color and tag information, which I'll get to in a moment. And of course, additional metadata. Not only metadata that it can derive from particular files, like Final Cut Pro movies, but EXIF information from the XMP headers on, on uh, still images. Uh, and of course, you can also create your own custom metadata um, and place that in uh, the, the database so that you can use that to categorize uh, your stuff as well. Uh, and that's all you know, stuff that should be inside of any asset management system. Um, but uh, the lovely thing about it is that it works pretty inherently with uh, the base operating system. So for example, this still image, which is actually located right here on my file system, right? I did a, a little click on this arrow, and it brought me right to the, the finder area. I'm going to just put this to the side and show you that the interaction of tags and color schemes that you can do inside of the MAM actually go right down to the OS level. I'm going to make this particular item red. And I'm going to enter in tags, lovely, delicious, entertaining. So I just did that very, very quickly in the MAM. And if I go back to the finder level, you'll see that that uh, JPEG image has a little red tag on it. And if I get information about it, oops, maybe I just need to go to another one real quick. Yeah, now let me go back here. There we go. So you can see that the tags, lovely, delicious, and entertaining, went all the way down to the OS level. And this is something that's been around since Mavericks. So the nice thing about that is that tags that you put in the OS will show up in this asset management system, and tags that you make in the asset management system are also going to show up in the OS level. That means that, let's say, God forbid, you lose your catalog, you still have that tagged information and can actually search upon it, not only with the general finder, but in any other application that would recognize tags inside of files. Um, and by the way, you know, I know all the MAMs that are out there. Nobody does this kind of stuff. Like goes, and of course, this is a Mac OS experience, right? This is not going to migrate over to another operating system. But for people who are all working on Mac laptops, that's a really lovely additional feature. All right, as I said, let's back up and actually create a new, um, what we're going to call a library. Um, for the geeks in the room, the back end of the system is all MongoDB, which is a no SQL uh, database system and uh, has wonderful, wonderful speed. So I'll say LACPUG. So here's my brand new library with nothing in it whatsoever. And then I'm going to go to my storage system, which is right over here, and show you how easy it is to import stuff. So I have, uh, let's see. MISC demo, that's right, files. I'm just going to take that whole folder and dump it in. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to do one part, which is within the context of the library, I have to create a subgrouping of information called a project. So I'll just call this miscellaneous project. OK, now I can do what I wanted to do. Bonk. 
and immediately the program analyzes everything inside that folder that I dragged in and immediately shows me that there are 31 video files and an audio file, there's seven images, there's one document, there's uh, no extra files. I can then filter the import and only bring in the things that I need, like just the video, just the audio, et cetera, et cetera. And then I can actually copy those files to where the location of the library is, or I can make references to them and leave them in place. So I import, and then it goes through a whole bunch of doodads in order to extract out um, file system metadata, and then of course metadata within the file if it can recognize it, and then builds me a really nice catalog. Incidentally, the catalog actually exists um, on my local hard drive, but I can place it anywhere that I want. So this is the catalog um, that exists in my user folder, and you know, for the geeks, it's a bundle, and it has all kinds of things inside of it. Um, but the bottom line is, is it's a single you know, a package, uh, a bundle, I should say. So it's very easy to uh, relocate if I need to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And immediately, all of the things that um, I had available to me before now show up in this catalog. And of course, there's a search field, so I can start to look for very specific things so that I can uh, bring up the stuff that I need. Now, when um, I brought in all this stuff, actually my computer is working pretty uh, heftily right now, as you can see, and the reason why is it is creating proxies for all of the motion video. I don't have to do that if I don't want, but the nice benefit of creating the proxies or the little baby versions of the movies is that if I disconnect this drive, those proxies are still available. So there's another application here. For all of you who have that closet filled with many, 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 FireWire, USB, and Thunderbolt drives, you now have a means by which to plug them in, drag just basically that root level you know, of the hard drive and throw it into this catalog, and it'll basically just catalog everything up for you, right? And when it's done, unplug it, put it back on the shelf, and now you have a beautiful catalog of everything that's in that closet, and you really know where it is. Um, and that's, that's a really lovely thing. I should show you what it's churning on right now. Here, it's showing you that it's running on a, a particular uh, background job. It's got 25 more to do, and it's basically churning on all the movie files that I threw into it, uh, making these individual proxies. And of course, you can see that it's beautifully multi-core aware. It's taking full advantage of my Core i7 that I have in the system, so it really uh, makes those uh, very, very quickly. Um, okay. So I have done a little bit on search. I want to show a, a little bit more about uh, filtration, though. I can very quickly filter on video, audio, imagery, document files, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, there is a geolocation feature that's built into it that leverages uh, OS X's uh, map feature, which is a really uh, just such a lovely thing. And I'll, I'll show you more about how that works in a moment. But that's also built into it. Um, there are also these things called smart media boxes, which uh, sort of work, work like uh, smart folders um, inside of Final Cut 10 or in the Finder, where essentially if I double click on this, there's a set of rules, right? So all of the following are true. Uh, kind equals documents, right? So if I'm just looking um, at this smart media box, I'm just looking at this Word document. Or recent photos, photos that, uh, I guess this one was, photos that uh, created within the last seven days, right? So that would immediately show up. And that is regardless of the library that's open. In case you're curious, you can only have one library open at a time. That's sort of like the modern uh, idea these days that you don't want to confuse yourself, so you only have one of these libraries open. But of course, you can have as many libraries as you wish if you want to differentiate them, or you can really dump everything into one big library. But I did talk about the sharing feature, so I want to show that now. Um, I've got a little um, MacBook Air over here, and it has its own little uh, USB 3 uh, SSD drive, and it's sitting on the same little MiFi network that I brought in. So there's really nothing up the sleeve here. Um, this would be very typical to a collaborative environment where a few of you were on the road with your own laptops. So over here under File Menu, I can select Library, Connect to Remote Library, and I happen to know the IP address of this thing because I want this demo to go really well. But the fact is that <laughs> there's a globe over there and actually it uses uh, multicast DNS or what we would refer, refer to as bonjour in order to find other Keyflow Pro instances running on this little network. 
Uh, but also, I've tested it. It can traverse across networks if you know the IP. And yes, if you VPN to another system, you can access somebody else's library that way as well. You'll also notice that I'm signing in. And that's a really lovely feature about libraries as well. You can only connect to libraries that you have designated access to for other people. So it's not a free for all. You can actually create accounts for your fellow collaborators. And only if you give them access will they have access. So I'm going to connect to this, um, to this uh, remote machine, and I'm connecting to the interviews. And what you're looking at right now is the library that actually exists on this little laptop over here. And I've got some clips of my Uncle Bundy, and I'm going to start playing them here. Uh, my fault. My yeah. So I'm streaming this over the little baby network over to my machine, right? These clips don't exist on my hard drive. Yes. They exist on this one over here. Die. So I can search this fellow collaborator's library just as easily as my own. And if, of course, I want the high res, I right click on it and I say download media, and here it comes. Now, there's nothing special about the transfer speed here. It's going to be as fast as the network that I've created for my collaborators. So um, although I have found out that I think they're using some kind of poor man's UDP type transfer so that you get like your own little baby Aspera uh, between these machines, so you actually get a really, uh, as fast as the, as the network allow uh, transfer. If you only have two collaborators, you could basically throw a Thunderbolt cable between the two machines machines and get a really nice connection that way. Or you have a nice gigabit Ethernet switch that you bought at Micro Center and you know plug everybody into it that way. And then you'll get you know really nice 100 megabyte per second plus uh, uh, transfer speeds uh, for everybody. So um, that's, that's the greatest, I, I think, you know, takeaway feature of this is not only can it be a personal asset management system for your uh, storage and your workflow, but also you can actually share your catalogs out. And let, let me show a little bit about that. So let me go back to um, a catalog that's local, which was the one that I just created a few moments ago, and um, show you uh, the preference settings for that. So this library called LAFCPUG and there's the UUID from the Mongo database. Anyway, if I want other people to be able to um, share with it, I can create accounts here with a username um, and a password. And then once created, I simply just drag that over into this little window over here. And as soon as I do that, that library is now available to be shared by um, that particular user when they connect to my machine. And this is the really important part. Everything about the sharing and um, the H.264 proxies that are coming over the network, that's pretty lightweight, especially for modern laptops, which means that these people can be working on other applications and just have Key Plo, uh, Flow Pro running in, the, don't ask me why they named it that thing, by the way. Um, other people can be running this in the background, and that means that their catalog will be continuously available, but they don't have to stop what they're doing in order to copy things to a FireWire drive, et cetera, or a Thunderbolt drive in order to get stuff over to you. That's the point. You just keep this thing running in the background, and then everybody can search each other's libraries and collaborate that way. Now, you might also be thinking, well, will they have a server version of this software so that if I do have shared storage, I could have like sort of like this autonomous version of it running on top of the shared storage? And the answer is yes. That is going to come much later, probably in the fall or maybe even next year. Uh, the first version of this application is essentially uh, probably just about what you see. Another thing I wanted to mention is that Keyflow Pro is taking advantage of the AV Foundation library so that exporting and transcoding and all of the formats that AV Foundation supports, basically ProRes, H.264 variants, et cetera, are available to you. But this is the real piece of cake that I think is fantastic. FFmpeg cannot be placed into a commercial piece of software. It violates its license. But if you install it yourself, there's no problem. So what happens here is if you go to FFmpeg's site and actually install this software and then simply drag the executable into this little well over here, <laughs> then you can use FFmpeg because you downloaded it and you installed it on your machine. 
the other thing that's lovely about the program is that um, the developers are actually considering the, the lovely uh, paradigm of in-app purchase, which is available for programs purchased from the App Store, and actually working with a codec bookie called Nablet, which is an offshoot of a company uh, that was called um, Main Concept. And what they're going to do maybe, and this is something that they're thinking about uh, uh, providing in the 1.0 release, is actually a pay-as-you-go codec scheme where if you need a particular export format and or codec, a wrapper and or codec, you can buy those as an in-app purchase and actually have those available in the application. But right out of the box, as long as you own a copy of Compre Compressor or Motion or Final Cut 10, you have the, um, the Pro Codecs installed, and therefore you'll have this part of it already installed when you install Keyflow Pro. Um, search. You can regulate how you're doing search so that you have the ability to just search particular string fields um, w which is going to have the content. Or, for example, you might exclude keywords so that keywords don't show up in searches that you're trying to do on file names or file paths, etc. And yes, there are watch folders. In fact, I've got a little watch folder set up right over here. And what you can do is you can actually drop things into those watch folders and they will automatically start doing something. Oh yeah, automatically start doing something. There's a whole workflow part to this program as well, which is so genius. Workflows can be created by basically doing the same thing that you saw me do with smart media boxes. So like, um, I could just say for all files, um, trans, uh, excuse me, encode the file to ProRes proxy um, with the current resolution and put it on, let's say, the desktop. Okay, and that workflow is going to be called ProRes Proxy to Desktop. Okay, I just made a workflow, and of course that workflow is now available anytime I want it just by right-clicking on an item, and you can see that that is immediately available. But the other thing about workflows is that you can automate them by doing the following. You can say that, for example, um, yeah, this is the point. Oh, right, I have to go back here. So if I've got uh, the miscellaneous project open and I say image tag, or you know, I can probably bring one of these. Yeah, I have to remember how to do this. I think, yeah, I just did it. ProRes proxy to desktop, okay. So uh, what that means is anything, anytime I drag a new movie into my miscellaneous project, it will immediately create a ProRes LT proxy and put it on the desktop. So you can actually set up automated workflows dependent on a particular type of event such as importing new things uh, into the piece. Um, so this little feature alone, I think, is well worth the price of admission, the idea of workflows. Oh, and of course, there's generic um, shares that these, again, are leveraging things that are already available in OS X, publishing to YouTube, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, and you can also leverage AirDrop, uh, regular emails. I should also show you that in the workflow, though, you can create something called a transfer, and this can transfer to today, FTP, SFTP, and web dev servers. So you could actually do little automations where you can transcode and then transfer files um, up to a particular site, et cetera. Okay, how much I got left? Like two minutes or something? Where did Michael go? Five minutes, okay. Uh, let's see, what else did I wanna show you? Well, oh, metadata. It, just to show you how you can make your own uh, metadata fields, that'll be good. Right now, you can just make strings, integers, or booleans, but um, here I'm gonna call it, uh, do I like it? And I'll make that a boolean. And let's see, the metadata key is yes. Okay, so this, is now going to be inside of my custom metadata right at the very top. So now here is my do I like it a boolean that's immediately available in the item metadata for my particular item. Oh, camera devices too. I mean, I, just believe me, you can hook up any kind of camera device that OS X recognizes, including an iPhone or an iPad, and it immediately shows up over here, and then you can import the media from there. In fact, I did want to show that to you. It's just that I don't have the table available unless I reach all the way over here. You can talk amongst yourselves for a second. Okay, I got it. 
Um, and I got a free USB port right over here. That's a good question. I think what you can do definitely, this kind of supersedes AirDrop to a certain extent, if you think about it, because you don't have to ask somebody for the file that you need. You can just go to their library and search for it and get it yourself. Um, let me just very quickly make sure it's unlocked. Right, okay, and then here comes the library on my phone, right? Now, I've got a lot of files on my phone, so I'm just gonna you know, talk at you for a little while while I wait for all the previews to show up from 2011 until 2015. And I thought, should I delete all the photos on my phone so that it would give a better demo? And then I thought, no, I'm not going to do that because you know, I don't really, I'm not, I like photos as far as the ability that I can see it. Ah, finally, okay, so here's the lovely part about this. This is really where it gets really cool because I'm gonna take, uh, let's see, uh, this photo, see now this is where Shimmy comes in. So here's Shimmy in Chicago, and here's Shimmy in Prospect Park, and then here's Shimmy at my client in uh, Soho, and then here's Shimmy in uh, uh, Times Square, and then here's Shimmy in Pennsylvania as we were coming home, right? So I'm gonna import those selected files into my miscellaneous project. And here they come. Now, in this case, because it's coming off of my phone, it's actually copying the files themselves into the library, right? So it's not doing a reference because it knows that this is probably gonna go away anytime soon. But this is really where the maps feature comes in so well. See, all of the, all the things that I just brought in are now showing up. Here's the picture I took of them in Pennsylvania. And if I zoom into New York, right? Um, Here's the ones that I took of him in Prospect Park, and here's the one in Soho, and here's the one in Times Square. And yeah, you can do searches as long as you're on the internet and say things like Times Square, right? And then all of the photos that were geotagged in that particular location are going to show up. So again, these are things that we've been waiting for in tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollar asset management systems, and it's available in uh, this little map, uh, this little app right here. So you're probably wondering how much it's gonna cost, and of course I waited until the end because you're supposed to do that in order to build tension. Um, <laughs> So the developer thinks uh, $299, $299, just like the price of Final Cut Pro will be the base price of the software. You'll see it in the App Store in July. Um, thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions? <coughs> yes, sir. Thanks. Prospect Park, and here's the one in Soho, and here's the one in Times Square. And yeah, you can do searches as long as you're on the internet and say things like Times Square. Right? And then all of the photos that were geotagged in that particular location are going to show up. So again, these are things that we've been waiting for in tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollar asset management systems. And it's available in uh, this little map, uh, this little app right here. So you're probably wondering how much it's gonna cost. And of course I waited until the end because you're supposed to do that in order to build tension. Um, <laughs> So the developer thinks uh, $299, $299, just like the price of Final Cut Pro will be the base price of the software. You'll see it in the App Store in July. Um, thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Thanks. <laughs>